Hello everyone, I am Liu. The title of our work is Making Private Function Evaluation Safer, Faster, and Simpler. This is the joint work when Xi Wang and Xiu Ming Yu. PFE, namely Private Function Evaluation, in the two-party scenario, consider the case where there are two parties, Alice and Bob. Alice has a private function f and private input f, and Bob has a private input y. These two parties intend to compute f s y, and finally, one or two parties obtains the result, and in this picture, Bob obtains the result. PFE is the general case of secure function evaluation, SFE. For SFE, the function f is public, and both parties know f. However, for PFE, the function f is private, and acts as a private input of one party. There are several ways to realize PFE. First of all, it is straightforward to realize PFE using fully homomorphic equation. However, today, fully homomorphic equation still has very high computational overhead. And the second is to use universal circuit. Universal circuit is the circuit that also takes the description of an input circuit C and input S and output CS. However, for circuits of size N, the corresponding universal circuit has additional log n overhead, and the constant factor and low order term are also significant. And the third line of approach avoids the usage of FHE and UC. One is based on oblivious evaluation of switching network, which also has additional log n overhead. And the other lines of work start from cars and Monka. The PFE protocol has linear complexity and constant route. Recently, it was shown that the tacitly secure PFE protocol outperforms the state-of-the-art tacitly secure UC-based PFE protocol. Following this light board, there are several improvements. The paper MS13 generalized and improved the protocol. Then recently, a reusability property when respect to, to given party is added. This means the two party only need one initiation for function f, and then they can evaluate f on different input directly. Here is an illustration for your reusability. These two parties initiate for private function f and then evaluate f on different input. For example, s1 and y1 to derive fs1, y1, and s2, y2 to derive fs2, y2, and so on. This property leads to better performance when the protocol is executed more than one time for the same function f. But those, but those uh, PFE protocols are passively secure, so what about active security? In the original KM11 paper, the author introduced how to achieve active security against malicious input provider. Then, the protocol in MSS14 achieves full security. However, the number of rounds of the protocol is equal to the number of gates. And to the best of our knowledge, there is no constant round actively secure PFE protocol with linear complexity. In our work, we provide the first constant round actively secure PFE protocol when linear complexity. Meanwhile, we provide a previously secure PFE protocol. And our two protocol achieve global reusability. Global reusability here means that 
the private function holder Alice can perform a global initiation for her private function app. Then a party Bob can use this information and start the evaluation of F when Alice multiple times. At the same time, another third party Charlie can also use this information and start the evaluation of F when Alice. So the initiation of F is global. In this talk, I will focus on our actively secure PFP protocol. As I have mentioned, in the KM11 paper, the author introduced how to achieve active security against malicious input provider using classical techniques for garbled circuit. And here we mainly focus on malicious function provider. And these two results can be combined to obtain a fully secure PFP protocol. Here we suppose that the private function F is implemented by a circuit that only consists of no end gates. And we also have public parameter like the circuit has data gates, and input bits, and M output bits, and other information about the circuit is hidden. We will work on cyclic growth G or point order Q with a decisional Diffie-Hellman assumption hole, a DDH assumption. And in this talk, we assume that Alice only has private input F and both obtains the evaluation result. We would like to know that it's easy to extend the protocol to support Alice private input F. We first introduced how to describe a circuit. For example, as we can see, this circuit has five input wires and three output wires. And we call wire, uh, outgoing wires if the wire is the input wires of the circuit, uh, the output wires of gates. And here the wires when orange colors are outgoing wires. And we call wire incoming wire if it is the input wires of gates. So these blue color wires are incoming wires. So for a circuit with theta gates and input bits and n output bits, we have n plus theta outgoing wires and two theta incoming wires. For example, in this circuit, theta is equal to six because it has six gates and n is equal to 5, and m is equal to 3. So we have 11 outgoing wires and 12 incoming wires. Because all gates are not end gates, the circuit can be described by the wire connections. To formalize the connections of wires, we use a concept named extended permutation, or EP. EP is a mapping pi that maps a number between 1 to n to a number between 1 to m, such that for every s in the set of 1 to m, there exists one number y in the set of 1 to m, such that y is equal to pi s. For circuit description, this means that even an index of an incoming wires, pi maps it to an index of an outgoing wires that connected when this incoming wires. This is an illustration of extended permutation for the example circuit. As we can see, one incoming wires connected with an outgoing wires, while one outgoing wires may connect it with several incoming wires because the outgoing the, the output wires of the circuit like the outgoing wire 9, 10, and 11 do not connect it when um, incoming wires. We do not need to consider these wires in the extended permutation mapping. So we let m equals to m plus theta minus m. So a in this example and n is equal to 2 theta. So 
12 in this example. And like in this map here, the connection like incoming wire 5 and outgoing wire 1, they are connected in this mapping. Now we know how to describe the circuit. At the beginning of the protocol, the circuit provides a naming wires and gates. She first named the input wires of the circuit. And then all wires connected when gates. And we introduced how to name the wires in detail in our paper. Then we can extract the extended permutation pi from this circuit. Now the circuit provides the Alice host circuit and the extended permutation pi. So we can let so we can let both gobbles or gates respectively. I want to note that because we divide a wire into an incoming wires and an outgoing wires. What can gobbles gates? But he still doesn't know the connection between wires. At the same time, Alice knows the extended permutation. She should know how to derive incoming wire labels from its connected outgoing wire labels to evaluate the gobbles circuit. But she should not know other wire labels. So to know how to derive incoming wire labels from outgoing wire labels, Alice needs to take part in the wire label generation. The procedure of our gobble circuit generation is here. Now first generate random, uh, random GI in the group for each outgoing wire and send them to Alice. So each outgoing wire I has an element GI. Then Alice performs the inverse of pi on those GIs. So as in this picture, if the two wires are connected, they will have the same values. Then Alice randomly picks Tj, then computes the Tj powers of each g pi j like this and sends them to Bob. So each one is raised to Tj power. Because Tj is random, those uh, g pi j to the power of Tj do not list any anything about the extended permutation pi. And after receiving those elements, but randomly picks alpha 0 and alpha 1. Then for labels when value b, Bob computes the, the alpha b power to the corresponding elements. And as for this example, uh, Bob computes the, for this incoming wire 1, computes the labels for value 0 in this form and the uh, labels for value 1 in this form. And the uh, wire labels for gate is like this left hand side gate. Now given those wire labels, Bob can gobble our gates. Bob used two input wire labels as the keys to increase the corresponding output wire labels for the output wires. And this is what we've done in classical gobble circuit approach. Now let's see how to evaluate the gobble circuit. To derive the wire labels of incoming wire from the wire labels of outgoing wire. Now let's focus on one gate. Even one of the two labels of the incoming wires phi and one of the two labels of the of the incoming wire six, we can decrypt the corresponding labels of the outgoing wire A. 
and now to derive the labels of the incoming wire 7. Let's see what this label should be. According to this extended permutation pi, incoming wire 7 is connected when the outgoing wire A. So pi 7 is equals to A. Now we can see if we compute the T7 power to the label we just declared, we obtain the corresponding incoming wire label. So Alice can follow this approach to evaluate the whole gable gate to obtain the final gable output. And let me summarize the procedure. First of all, Bob sends random growth element GI for each outgoing wires I. Then Alice performs the extended permutation pi on those GIs random and randomly piece T trip and compute the T trip powers of each element. And Alice sends those elements to Bob. Bob will randomly choose alpha 0 and alpha 1 to compute the wire label. And then send all gable gates together when he is gable inputs for Y to Alice. And Alice will evaluate the gable circuit using gable gate, gable inputs, and the extended permutation pi and TJ to obtain the gable output and send it to Bob. Finally, Bob can obtain the, the evaluation result from the gable output. And we can divide the procedure into two phases, the initiation phase and the evaluation phase. And because we work on the group where DDH assumption holds, the DDH assumption allows Bob to generate different alpha 0 and alpha 1, and two party execute the evaluation phase for F multiplied times using different inputs. To achieve active security, because the evaluation phase is similar to classical gable circuit. And Alice only needs to evaluate the gable circuit. In fact, the authenticity of gable circuit ensures that Alice cannot harm the security of the protocol. So now we only need to focus on ST security of the initiation phase. Let's see the message sent in the initiation phase. We need to ensure that Alice send correct message. And this means that we need a zero knowledge pool of knowledge for valid extended permutation pi performed on those two elements. And we also need a zero knowledge pool of, uh, zero knowledge pool of knowledge of the power TJ to stress them in the security proof. For these two goals, we first focus on the second one. We may first try to use zero knowledge pool of knowledge of this grace block with them. However, when we use such a protocol, the elements G pi J should be given, and then the extended permutation pi is liquid. Our solution is to use a gamma equation of the elements. Since it is multiplicatively homomorphic, and we can compute the TJ power. So the procedure is here. Suppose that Alice generates a path of key for our gamma equation, and the private key is that, such that the private key H is the power of GF. And then Alice first increase G pi J. Then she can compute the increase element to the power of TJ over the cybertest CJ. 
After that, Alice sent the two cyber tests to Bob and pulled the knowledge of TJ. And finally, Alice can help Bob decrypt the cyber test ZJ to the power of TJ. And due to the encryption, G pi J is preserved and the extended permutation pi is hidden. Now the first protocol is that even GI and L gamma subtest CJ prove that the proven nodes are J and a valid extended permutation pi such that CJ is encrypting G pi J. To prove this statement, we can describe the L gamma subtest in a different way. As we can see in these pictures for the extended permutation, each incoming wires connected with exactly one outgoing wire. So we can define a vector E for each incoming wire, such that E pi map J to I, E size entry is equal to 1, and otherwise the entry is equal to 0. So for the multi exponentiation form, only the elements g pi j remains. So we can rewrite all subtests in this form. So now we can say that an extended permutation pi is valid if only if all subtests cj can be represented in this new form, such that the inner product of vector 1 and ej is equal to 1. This means that the sum of all entries of the vector ej is equal to 1. And the entry-wise product between the vector ej and the vector ej minus the vector 1 is equal to 0. This means that each entry of ej is either 0 or 1. So this condition is equal to the condition of all that EJI is equal to 1 if pi j is equal to i and 0 otherwise. We can rewrite the second condition as the entry was pulled up of to vector EJ is also equal to EJ. I also would like to note that now the subtest CJ can be regarded as an L gamma commitment to the vector EJ. Let's see the first statement. We need to prove that all subtest CJ satisfies the conditions that the sum of all entries of EJ is equal to 1. And in fact, we can batch the statement of, of all subtests together. We let the verifier fit a random challenge omega for the prover. Then both party computes the product of all cipher tests raised to the power of omega to the power of j. And we call this new cipher test c. And in fact, it's the commitment to such a vector e. And because omega is random, it's the sum of omega to the power of j times the condition is equal to the sum of omega to the power of j. Then all conditions hold an overwhelming probability. So we can let big omega equals to the sum of small omega to the power of j. And it's enough to only prove that the inner product of vector 1 and vector e is equal to big omega. Now we can use the new statement that that it is vector e and random calls r e such that e is the committee value inside C and the inner product of vector 1 and e is equal to big omega. This is the inner product for committee vector and we provide a modified version of protocol in the bulletproof paper to prove this fact. 
Now let's move to the second condition. To prove that this condition for all ciphertests, we can follow a similar procedure as before. We let verifier P to random challenge S and Y for the prover. Then both party computes the product of each ciphertest that are raised to the power of S to the power of J. And similarly, we can regard the resulting ciphertest C as the algorithm commitment to such a vector D. Because S is random, it is sum of S to the power of J times the entry wise product of two uh, vectors EJ minus the vector D is equal to zero. Then the condition for all J holds with overwhelming probability. Let vector DJ equals to S to the power of J times vector EJ. We let vector DJ star vector EJ equals to the sum of dji times eji times y to the power of i. Then, if the vector dj star uh, ej is equal to zero, then the entry-wise product of vector dj and ej is equal to vector zero with overwhelming probability. So we can match the condition for all j as an equation. And the sum of Vector dj star vector ej uh, plus minus vector uh, vector one star vector d is equal to zero, and this statement can be proven by zero knowledge argument introduced in the paper BG12, and we also provide an improvement of the protocol in our paper. Now let me summarize our modification to make the initiation actually security. Now the message from Alice for each incoming wire is to cyber test together when the elements for the question of the second cyber test. And Alice also needs to prove the zero knowledge of her valid extended permutation pi the knowledge of TJ, and the knowledge of the private key for the Ogama encryption scheme. And, and the complexity of this protocol is linear in the numbers of wires in the circuit. And the numbers of wires in the circuit is linear in the numbers of gates in the circuit. So the complexity is linear in the numbers of gates. An important thing is that all messages from Bob in the initiation phase are random. So they can be generated by random oracle to make the initiation phase no interactive. And all parties playing the roles of Bob can verify Alice's message and start the evaluation phase with Alice. So for this global reusability, Alice published the no entity initiation phase, and other party can download this information, verify the correctness, and then start the evaluation phase when Alice for the private input private function f. And that's all of my top. If you are interested in this work, please find the full version on ePrint. Thank you very much.